Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Tom Roach. I'm joined today by my guest, Heather Augustine. Uh, Heather has written extensively about Jamaican music. Heather, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, I know you had a, a book come out this year, uh, Women in Jamaican Music. Um, let's, let's start out broad here. Uh, okay. Um, you know, what do we mean by Jamaican music? What's, what's special sure. about it? How do we know it? Sure. Well, most people, I think, know Jamaican music because they know Bob Marley or they know reggae. But the kind of era that I specialize in comes before that, and that's ska music. So ska music. Now, it's interesting because I always thought ska came later because I didn't hear about it until later. But right, actually, right. It's, it predates most of what I've it heard. It does, probably. and that's a common conception. Yeah. But, um, but, but ska music really comes from Jamaica in about 1959 and runs through about 1964. Uh, and it, it's a blend of the indigenous music of Jamaica, which was Mento. So if you're familiar with Calypso, it's very similar. Um, jazz music. And Calypso's from Trinidad. That's right. right. That's yeah. right. Very good. And the um, jazz music was very popular in Jamaica because Jamaica had a lot of tourism. And they were playing what was popular at the time in the 1940s and 50s, yeah. jazz music. And then American rhythm and blues, because in Jamaica they could pick up the uh, radio stations sure. on a good night. Those three forms of music blended and became ska. It's a very lively music. The tempo is upbeat. There's a lot, there are a lot of horns, saxophones, and trombones, and trumpets. And that music runs through about 1964. Reggae doesn't come until 1968. You say it runs through 64. Is it disrupted yeah. by the British invasion that, uh, no. that turned everything ups upside down in the U.S.? Is Not that, really, no. although I will say I think that it influenced the British invasion to some degree. Yeah. But no, the music just changed. I think it kind of ran its course. The, um, it, was, it was so lively for so long, um, and the music, frankly, it slowed down a little bit, the mm -hmm. tempo did, into what's called rock steady. That lasted for about two years, and then reggae is slower yet, very mellow, and has yeah. the Rasta rhythms in And there. that's more the music we associate with Bob Marley. That's right. right? That's so right. Uh, let's go back to the ska music for a minute. Is sure. there any of that that made its way into American culture, anything that uh, our listeners might be familiar with? Well, absolutely. I think in 1964, what most people would be familiar with, even if they weren't around in 1964, yeah. is a song called My Boy Lollipop by Millie Small. No kidding. Really? That's ska. Oh that comes gosh. from Jamaica. Uh -huh. I thought that came yep. out of one of those, uh, you know, song factories in <laughs> New York. Really? <laughs> right. No, and it, it, well, it came from the song factory known as Chris Blackwell and Island Records when he was just establishing Island Records. I remember Island Records, mm -hmm. yeah. And he, well, they produced U2 and Stevie Winwood and everything later on. Um, but uh, Millie Small had this very distinctive voice. It's yes, kind of a little did. baby voice. Yeah. He heard her. Um, he was in Jamaica for, for quite a while. His family so she was, was there. She was Jamaican. She was rural Jamaican. She was from a little place called Milk Run, a little really? village. Yeah. He, he plucked her out of Jamaica, and he um, kind of took Jamaica out of her a little bit by teaching her to speak without yeah. patois. And then she became very a, a global sensation that I, year. I remember when that mm -hmm. song came out. I thought right. I was sure she was an American teenager. Yeah. I, I nope. wouldn't nope. have yeah. guessed. Yeah, so most people would know that song, um, and then I think most people would know the ska music that comes out of England in um, the early 1980s. So, so that's much further along. Much further along, now, much different. Uh, you know, now I always associated Louie Louie with, uh, with Jamaica, but I guess that's... Uh yeah, it's That's really not. not part of that movement. No, huh? it's not, but maybe um, the American rhythm and blues, I could see where you would think that because the American rhythm and blues was definitely part of the Jama what, what influenced Jamaicans to make their sound. Right. So a lot of the doo-wop harmonies are found in rock steady and um, a lot of the that shuffle beat is mm -hmm. found in ska too. So it's... It's not a very linear path. Everything is, is, is right. influencing it. Which is true with so many uh, of genres course. of music. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and your book, uh, Women in Jamaican Music, what are you, what mm -hmm. are you tracking there? I understand that women were actually a very small part of Jamaican music for a long time, right? That's absolutely right, as they were yeah. for many genres. But I think um, what made me write this book was when I realized that uh, a, friend, a very good friend of mine, Roger Steffens, who's uh, an expert in Bob Marley, said there have been over 500 books written about Bob Marley. Oh my and gosh. I thought, wow, uh, that's the last thing the world needs is another book on Bob Marley. <laughs> but I was realizing that 
when we, when we picture Bob Marley, a lot of times we picture the I-3s, the three women right. that stood behind him. And so right. I was really um, interested more in the women that were relegated to that back row. And so I started digging in and finding there were quite a few women who maybe were forced to sing duets. Mm -hmm. I say forced like because they really weren't given the option to sing a solo. Yeah. Um, and some of them even ran their own music studios. They were mm -hmm. record producers. Um, they were, they ran the lines for the equipment and the microphones in the studio for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought, well, somebody needs to really talk about these women because without them, I mean, they're really the backbone of the Jamaican yeah. industry. Um, uh, give us a story of one of them. Uh, okay, sure. Well, so there was one woman, her name's Janet Enright, okay. a guitarist in the 19, late 1940s, throughout the 1950s. And she had her own orchestra and a quartet. But when she first started, she was only 14. And she came from a very proper family, very wealthy. And wealthy families did not, uh, music was considered lowbrow. It was downtown music. So when she snuck out and was performing with this massive jazz orchestra, the Eric Dean's Orchestra, her dad caught wind of it and went there and found her on stage and snuck behind stage and <laughs> unplugged her amp. And he said, you're coming home with me, kind of like dragged her by the ear and he said, you're coming home with me. How but old was she at this point? 14, 14 so she was okay. 14. But yeah. she went on to lead her own, um, her own group, the Janet Enright Quartet. And um, she's not very well known, but those who do know, know her. Mm. And she really helped support a lot of the men that became popular. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, one of your uh, books was titled Ska, The Rhythm of Liberation. Right. Um, the, what, do, what do you mean by the, the rhythm of liberation? Well, ska music and Jamaican music as a whole is political. So even though, even the songs... And this is calypso music, right? Absolutely. So calypso music, those, the, the vocalists were kind of town criers. Yeah. So they were reporting the news and the gossip and being a little bawdy. Um, the same for mento music too. So a lot of it is, is um, innuendo, but gossipy mm -hmm. um, and political too. For ska music, um, many of the lyrics are political, but a lot of ska is instrumental because like I said, it's, it's based in jazz. Mm -hmm. So it's the song titles that are sometimes political like Marcus Garvey, um, and uh, there's uh, there are quite a few that come a little bit later there's in the a ska Rasta song movement. called Marcus Garvey. There is. So how does uh, a ska singer in Jamaica uh, come across Marcus Garvey? I'm just curious. Well, he well he was Jamaican, yeah. and so also Marcus Garvey was Jamaican. Yeah, I, oh, he see, is. I, I, I yeah. should know more about oh, this. Oh, that's then. Okay, okay. Yeah, and right. he was so he's a national hero. Okay. Um, but I mean, he came to the U.S. and had yeah, his movement I'm here, obviously, yeah. right? But he also um, was in a, a very big influence, his writings were, to the Rastafari movement. Okay. So the, the liberation, the emancipation, the return, re repatriation, um, all of those themes come in the Rastafari movement and that comes from Marcus Garvey's writings. So a lot of these musicians, even the ska musicians, before the reggae era, yeah. the Rastafari um, members were meeting in the hills um, they were oppressed, so they had to meet in the hills in, in secret. Um, and so they would get together after they would perform at one of these fancy all-white clubs, go to the hills, and they would have their communal jam sessions, yeah. free form, um, and, but jazz. So there's horns, and then there's the Rasta drums, and then there's the Rasta philosophy, like Marcus Garvey, and um, biblical you know, philosophies yeah. as well. Um, so a lot of that creeps into the music and even if it's not overt, like a title or the vocals, the lyrics, it still is in the sound. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of minor chords and what they call the Eastern sound that comes into the music during this time. And I, I you know, that, that sounds um, like what I've heard in some of uh, Bob Marley's music as well. I Absolutely, think, yeah. right. And so Bob was definitely influenced by, and he started ska, um, and so his early music is very, you know, it sounds kind of like pop music because it's bouncy and it's that ska faster tempo. But then later when he is being informed by the Rastafari movement, yeah. then his, his music and definitely his lyrics contain a lot of Marcus Garvey and a lot of biblical references and, Interesting. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, staying with Bob Marley for a minute, um, 
uh, he, he must have done songs that were ska throughout his career, right? Well, I wouldn't say throughout his career because, but definitely early on. What are some that we um, might be familiar with? I was just curious. I would say there's Judge Not, okay. One Cup of Coffee. Um, those are uh, ska songs and they were some of the, the, they were two of the first that he ever recorded. So if you go yeah. YouTube or Google it, you'll hear it and you'll hear his voice, he's very young. Mm -hmm. So you can hear it and you'll say, oh, that's Bob Marley. And it, he sounds just like a little boy because he was. Interesting. Um, but then later on, the, the depth and that you know, wisdom in his voice really comes out yeah. as he ages. So uh, you can probably explain, I shot the sheriff to us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, before, yeah, that song was Bob Marley before Eric Clampton made it popular. But um, <laughs> You know, it's it's a typical song about kind of being misunderstood and being um, uh, judged as you know a criminal when really it's a matter of circumstance. Mm -hmm. That those themes run in a lot of Jamaican music, and the movie "The Harder They Come" with Jimmy Cliff also is about that theme. Really? So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what you know, what happened after? Um, Clapton did his version of it. Does that did that bring a lot more attention onto things? Absolutely. I know that's when I sort of became more aware of right. this stuff. Right. Absolutely, yeah. it did. Uh, is is there more to say about the relationship to Calypso music? Um, I, I know that uh, you yeah, know the sure. political connection with Calypso music. Obviously. Right. Well, Calypso was very. And Calypso, uh, it, it you know, was how popular. far is Trinidad from? It's Chile? not. It's not far. Yeah, they're all in the, the the kind of the same the Caribbean region, all the same. And so and they're all influencing one another, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And they they're all have more uh, African roots than anything else. Oh they, yes, right? this is music of the diaspora. One hundred percent. Because these places were mostly populated by by African slaves Absolutely. initially, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It it is. And um, but the music of Trinidad, so the Calypso. Um, and then and soca music later too, um, but the music of Trinidad uh, was very popular at this time, and so Mento, the indigenous music of Jamaica, was very similar. So they kind of capitalized on the calypso trend, um, and that's sometimes you'll see they call it Jamaican calypso. It's really not. That's just a marketing thing. It's really yeah. Mento music. But if you've seen, um, you know, the maracas, maybe a little banjo, a flute. And then the rumba box, that is Mento and that, you know, the rumba box has the little keys and then the, the instrumentalist will sit on the box to play it. I see. And the, the similarity is there's a similar sound, but it's really the lyrics too. Um, but they would, just like they had Calypso tents where they would have competitions in Trinidad, um, that there were some musicians that did that then in Jamaica too. So mm -hmm. it... It really all crosses over. And, and the mento music, uh, you said, is the uh, uh, native music of Jamaica? That's right. Like, how, yep. but how far back does that go? I mean, it's not... 30s, 40s. Oh, I see. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's just earlier than the, than the exactly. ska music, basically. Right, right? Yeah. exactly. So um, it's, it's hard to find a mento record. There weren't a lot of recordings during this time because the recording era in Jamaica was in its infancy. But there are some, and they're on um, 78 RPM. Um, and on shellac, so they definitely, they didn't really last that long too because it's essentially a piece of glass. Um, mm -hmm. So those two, com you know, we don't have a lot of those recordings left. Yeah. But. Um, so um, let's, let's um, think about this in terms of how it influenced uh, music in the U.S. if we could sure. for a minute, right? Yeah. So we talked about how uh, it, it, it leaked in a little bit in the, uh, right. in the 50s and early 60s. Right. What about since then? Okay, so since then, I think most of the ska influence that we have comes from a different route. Um, it comes through England. So uh, England picked up on the ska trend uh, before we did. Um, in 1979 to about 1984, um, there's a ska resurgence or maybe just, it, it broke through um, in popularity with what we call the two-tone movement. That was the name of the label. So if you're familiar with bands like the selector or the specials or the English beat um, or the beat they were um, yeah. known as the English beat here uh, madness uh, those those bands were popular in England and so a lot of Americans picked up on that movement they heard you know the that it was popular there and so they thought wow what is this sound it really sounds nothing like the Jamaican original yeah. um, there's the same tempo and there are horns but it was mixing with punk at that time 
Um, and so America then, you know, when they hear that, some bands pick up on it and then they start their own bands here too. But really in America, ska doesn't become popular until um, the mid 90s to the late 90s. So if you're familiar with bands like well, Fishbone predates that, but Fishbone in the 1980s um, was popular, and then there are a number of popular bands too, like Real Big Fish became very popular. No Doubt actually was pop was ska originally, so Gwen mm -hmm. Stefani, if you're familiar with her, she's um, she was ska first. Um, but then the Toasters was very big on the um, in New York, but America obviously very big country, so we have different flavors of ska here. So the East Coast has a different sound than the West Coast. Um, Midwest kind of has its own sound too. Florida has a very distinctive sound. Um, and that's really what makes American ska unique. Mm -hmm. um, what's the uh, relationship to the culture in Kingstown to all of this? Because I know it, it has a uh, kind of a it's kind of a mecca for people who are interested in this kind of music. What, Definitely. What is it about right, Kingston? Right. What's it, if I went to Kingston, what would I be immersed in? Well, um, Kingston today is very different. It's very, very different. So they're trying to revive some of the music industry, but there's really no ska in Kingston now. Really? No. They call it oldies music or granny music. They really want nothing to do with it. Now it's all dance hall and yeah. Um, but. Uh, there were a number of artists that during the reggae era yeah. um, that went there to record. So, for example, the Rolling Stones went to record Goat's Head Soup there. Mm -hmm. And they recorded at Dynamic Sounds, which was Byron Lee's studio. Um, and so it really was a collaboration. And um, Cat Stevens, the same thing. He recorded there. Paul Simon recorded there. Elton John tried to record there, but... Um, that's an interesting story. What happened for Elton John? Um, well, the producers were striking at the time, and so they kind of, when they saw him pull up in his big fancy car, they kind of um, ran him out of town. So, really? Yeah, they, they threw some things at his car, and, and he was scared <laughs> and drove off and went right to the airport. So, uh, but He wasn't there really. Yeah, no, he wasn't. But, you know, it's, I think... A number of artists since then have returned to record there, yeah. um, especially in, in uh, recent years because um, Tough Gong, which was Bob Marley's label, um, is back up and running again and doing digital. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the trouble, too, is that a lot of these um, studios are still analog. Some people like that because well, that's, that's that authentic sound. Yeah, I think yeah. it's preferable. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you mentioned uh, the Stones doing Goat's Head Soup. So right. does, that, does that have a... A Kingston uh, ska flavor? flavor to it. I don't would know you if say? it really does. I guess might have to ask some Stones aficionados, yeah. but I don't really think it does. It's still yeah. very Stones, but yeah. um, they got to hang out in Kingston, I guess. They did. They did. In fact, they shipped their boat down. A wood. They shipped a wood, the boat. They did a wood. <laughs> a wood. <laughs> they have yes. a lot of money. <laughs> they do, and it was a wood hull boat. So when they were going to take it off the ship, the the forklift driver in Jamaica went right through the wood hull and oh. and destroyed it. So yeah, and that that, that made them very yeah unhappy. that became a problem. <laughs> oh. And uh, Paul Simon, um, me and Julio down by the seashore or something? Is no, that it was Mother and, Mother and Child, Child Reunion, Reunion was yeah. recorded there. Okay, right, right, right. right. Okay. But I do like that song. But it's that album. Yeah. yeah. It it's, is, right, right, album. right. Yeah. yeah, it is. And, Interesting. You know, I think it was during this time they realized that Jamaica really was a mecca for music. You know, yeah. that there was, um, it was kind of a, a niche. Um, yeah. But, but J Jimmy Cliff and Bob Marley really kind of put it on the map. And sure. so I think they were hearing... Um, artists like that, um, they, they definitely would have known artists like Toots Hibbert, Toots and the Maytals. Um, he just passed away this past year, I believe from COVID. Um, but he was prominent in the, the movie, The Harder They Come. They were hearing yeah. this stuff. These guys knew their music. Yeah. So th I think they went there to record because they heard something unique in that sound. Yeah, I think everybody mm -hmm. does. And they may right, not know right. what it is, but I, you right. know, and, and perhaps we blur our understanding of the Jamaican and the, yeah. uh, the Trinidad sound. Um, but, yeah. it, you know, um, it, it, it seems like um, Kingston was kind of a place to go if you were a college student in the 50s or the 60s. And, these, you know, these bands were trying to affiliate themselves with it. The, the, you know, the Kingston trio, even though they really yeah, weren't yeah. doing 
Jamaican right, music, called right, themselves right. the Kingston Trio. Right, right. Uh, and the Kingsmen did um, Louie Louie, which is right, not, right. You, say, you're, you were saying that it's not necessarily a No, it's not, a, but a I can Jamaican see there's still something about that style that they probably well, wanted the to accent, emulate. And of course, right, of the, Absolutely. Of the singer. Absolutely, right, right. Yeah. But I'm thinking, too, you know, like Donovan, um, a couple of his songs, he used a flute player, a flautist, who, um, Harold McNair, um, he was Kingstonian. He was really? from Alpha Boy School. Do you and remember he, what he was on? He was on Pied Piper and, oh gosh, you're going to get me now. Another, oh, another right. one, yeah. yeah. Um, Pied Piper, uh, there's a Crispin St. Peter Pied Piper song. I think it's that one, that but one. didn't Donovan cover that? He might have, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then there's another one, though, that Don, Donovan has, and I can't remember it now, but yeah. uh, it's, it's very good. And so the, f the flute player in there, and he was, um, that's another, per there's an example of how Harold McNair Nair tried to capitalize on the Calypso branding, because he produced an album of Calypso songs. Yeah. But he's not Trinidadian. So, so um, for people who are interested in this, uh, yeah. I understand that... Um, You've been uh, working on an archive. Uh, yes, that is I have. Uh, at Indiana University. Is that right? That's right. Would, it's could the. You, would you like to tell us about that? Sure, sure. It's the Archives of African American Music and Culture, and it is at Indiana University Bloomington. Um, but I have, over since about 1995, I've conducted over 180 interviews with uh, Jamaican musicians. British musicians and American musicians. That's a phenomenal number yeah. there. Um, this is like Alan Lomax. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with the Lomax story, right? Uh, I am, yes. And the, the Library of Congress, right? Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, no, I, it's a labor of love. Um, but I, so How long I, are these interviews? They're, well, I mean, they vary. I mean, some of them are, you know, an hour, an hour and a half. My some are Some are brief. But... Um, most are fairly substantial, enough for the person to tell me their story. Yeah. And um, when I started, I, w I was doing my uh, interviews on micro cassette tapes. Sure. Um, because that was, you know, what worked for my equipment from Radio yeah. Shack, but that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so um, so yeah. they're in digital form, some are, but most are on micro cassette tape. So I have given those all, donated all of those to the, the archives, and they are digitizing them. Right. They're, they're maintaining those um, cassette tapes in a climate-controlled environment where they will be stored. Yeah. But then those digital interviews will be available for the public and future scholars to use in their research. Many of these people have since passed away, especially yeah. lately. But when we're talking about music from the late 1950s, and early 1960s, a lot of these folks, um, when they were, that was when they were in their prime, um, they've passed away. So I feel very fortunate um, that they gave me the gift of their story. Yeah. And so I want to make sure that this gift um, becomes part of uh, the historical canon. Well, um, I'm just curious, where did you find some of these people? I'm sure they were, you had to really uh, I did. go to some yeah. strange out of the way places, right? I did, yeah. Well, give so, me an example. Um, well, I've been to Kingston quite a few times. Sure. Um, and so uh, that has produced some um, fruitful interviews, going to people's homes, but it's, it's a matter of um, really connecting. And so when I have a friend who says, you know, oh, did you talk to this person yet? No. Oh, well, let's go over there now. Um, that's been really? helpful. Yeah. But most of them are done on the phone yeah. and people are very generous with their stories. Um, they, I think, have not had been appreciated. They've so, certainly I mean, not been paid So properly. these aren't people that are living in uh, uh, high-rise apartments uh, no. because of their fame and fortune. No, right? no, um, they languish in obscurity, really. Yeah. And so um, when I find somebody, I typically say, you know, is there anybody else that I should talk to? And they'll give me a few more contacts. And so it's kind of like a hydra. You know, you cut off one head and two grow back. And yeah. so I've, I've really enjoyed it, though, because to me, I, I just feel like a conduit through which they're telling their stories. Yeah. And, um, and, and they're fascinating, just amazing, the things that they've been through. Um, but a lot of them have never told anybody their story yeah. outside of family. Uh, is, is this putting together a picture for you? Uh, you know, is, is the accumulation of these uh, little bios uh, telling you something? Absolutely, and that definitely was my approach. Yeah. So at first, when I started interviewing people, it became so unwieldy, I didn't really know how to go about it, and I, I put the tapes in a shoebox, and it sat there for about 10 years. <laughs> I, it was just too much, and I didn't, this story is too big. How can I tell it from this? So, yeah. um, but then I started to see 
common themes, definitely, you know, a narrative of a chronological narrative. Um, so I start to see patterns and that's how I put things together, but it took a while to get there. Now, right. yeah, sure I do. And from talking to friends who have lived through this era, um, these, many of these eras too, they're able to kind of help me to um, yeah. clear my vision a little bit. Yeah, I imagine most of them just got into this because of some interest they had in it, not because they studied it or... Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, right. absolutely. That's, that's really how it is. Yeah, very yeah. good. Thank you. Um, well, that's all the time we have for our program. I want to thank Heather Augustine for joining me today on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Tom Roach. See you next time.